Hello, everyone. My name is Katie McMillan. I'm the CEO of WellMade Health, and I'm pleased to be joined by Jeff Cutler and Rayanne Delal from Ada Health. Uh, we're going to talk about realizing the promise of a better and faster patient experience through a digital front door. I want to remind everyone to introduce themselves and ask any questions in the chat, and we'll do our best to get each of your questions throughout the session. Any questions we don't get to, we will pick up with during the roundtable at the end of the day. No doubt many of you know Jeff. He is a veteran in the healthcare industry with over 25 years of experience. He's the chief commercial officer at Ada Health and leads their business in the Americas. Before Ada, he was working with Tido Care and Vitals. And Rayan Dalal is responsible for overseeing and managing Ada's US enterprise clients and also works with Ada's US partners to ensure that they're meeting their digital health goals through the use of Ada's AI and new and existing patient care journeys and experiences. It's great to have you both here today. Um, Jeff, you've been with Ada for almost four years now and you've been doing incredible work. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to see you again and thank you for inviting us to participate today. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with Ada, Ada has been around for about 12 years. We were founded 12 years ago on the very idealistic vision to democratize access to healthcare on a global basis. Uh, our feeling has always been just that people don't have the access to the right tools, resources throughout the world to get the healthcare they need. And we're not just referring to some of the lower and middle income countries around the world, but the vast healthcare deserts we have here in the US. Uh, originally, we founded the company by building a comprehensive medical knowledge base. And we combine that with an AI, artificial intelligence, probabilistic reasoning engine to determine the probabilities that someone's suffering from a certain condition based on their constellation of symptoms. We started out as a clinical decision support tool, but pivoted about six years ago and launched Ada first as a consumer app. And in the last six years, it's become the number one consumer app in the world, where we now have over 12 million users that have conducted over 25 million assessments. Over the last four years, I've been working with healthcare partners here in the US to adapt our platform for their own enterprise use so that we can take their patients through a self-assessment to determine what might be ailing them and direct them to the right care at the right time. Um, overall, our mission, our vision is to put aid in the hands of a billion people on earth through both our consumer partnerships and our enterprise partnerships. And we feel we're well on the way to doing that. That's fantastic. So exciting to hear. And so you were just mentioning that your goal is to direct patients to the right care at the right time. Um, how do you do that specifically? And more importantly, how do you do it differently than other digital health companies out there? Sure. Well, we start the process by, by um, uh, we built our platform so that it's a, uh, it's a very comprehensive, empathetic, what I'll call question and answer chatbot. So we have this chatbot that sits on top of our medical intelligence engine and queries the user for some basic information. It starts with demographics, name, age, sex, we then ask some of the major risk factors, and then we take them through a very comprehensive assessment of it's designed to mimic the way a medical professional, a doctor would be speaking to them in really getting into the details of the symptoms that they're experiencing. From that, we determine the probabilities that they're suffering from a certain condition or an ailment, and we then work with our enterprise partners to map those particular conditions and triage levels to their particular care modalities. So at the end of an ADA assessment, it may present, there's a 60% chance that you're suffering from viral sinusitis. And if so, you should see a doctor in the next X days. And then working with our enterprise partners, we actually then direct the patient to the specific care options they have. So if it's to see a doctor within a few days, we may be offering the ability for them to book an appointment with that doctor, to actually uh, enter a telehealth consultation, to walk into a clinic, or whatever other care modalities they offer. We also then take the information that the patient has provided to us, as well as the information we're pulling from our medical knowledge base, and we make that available on the next step of that patient's journey. So if they're going to be seeing a clinician, we'll make that information available in the electronic health record in the EHR so that the clinician can read the full dialogue and also benefit from the differential diagnoses that we identified that they might not normally be familiar with. Yeah, that's fascinating. It sounds like you're really working to close the loop and make sure all the right parties have the right information after they have the encounter with Ada. I love that. 
it's it's interesting because I often like to to, to start speaking by asking uh, an audience if they know the number one reason people in the United States go to see a doctor, and often get a lot of blank stares. And and, and frankly, the number one reason that people go to a doctor is to find out if they need to see a doctor. So we, we sort of take that guesswork um, out of it and give them the information they need as to what type of doctor they need to see, whether they can take care of something on their own, whether they can benefit from going to a pharmacy or whatever type of care would best suit them. Very interesting. And you mentioned um, in the example of sinusitis that there was potentially a you know 60% chance that you could have this. And it looks like you are really trying to raise the bar for clinical accuracy when it comes to AI and user accessibility. So how do you get to those percentages? How do you measure diagnostic accuracy and ensure that um, what you're telling patients is safe and accurate and that those standards are getting better and better over time? Uh, it's a great question. Um, first and foremost, Ada was founded with a very deep clinical foundation. Um, our co-founder, Dr. Claire Noverall, is our chief medical officer, and she oversees about 50 to 60 full-time doctors who have been building our underlying knowledge base for the last 11, 12 years and oversee it on a daily basis. We measure everything from that clinical uh, uh, foundation. And in particular, we measure things across three axes, condition coverage, accuracy of our recommended uh, uh, diagnoses and medical safety. And in certain parts of the world, we're actually regulated as a medical device. So for instance, in Europe, we're regulated as a medical device and we've structured our company to be able to continue to operate throughout the world um, uh, uh, being regulated in that way. So ultimately, if, if and when the US goes in that direction, we'll be prepared to do it. And what we also have is as a medical device, we're required to have both clinical a uh, research uh, team, as well as a post-market surveillance team to monitor its performance and its activity in the market. And part of that clinical research team is continually evaluating ADA against real world cases, as well as clinical vignettes. And we've published a number of studies outlining our clinical excellence against some of the others in the industry, as well as against actual doctors themselves. And we have that all published on our website under our, researches page, under our research page. Awesome. I'm always happy to see digital health companies put their research out there loud and proud. It makes it a lot easier for people looking into validating the technology. Yeah, we talk a lot about our focus on clinical excellence. And in particular, we focus on, we continually focus on three things in measuring clinical excellence, condition coverage, the accuracy of our recommendations and the safety. Um, we continually publish research to measure and, and report on it. And in a study that we published in the BMJ Open, the, the British Medical Journal, uh, about a year or two ago, we actually found that ADA had, uh, first of all, the, uh, the highest condition coverage compared to, to doctors. We were up around 99% condition coverage. And a lot of that is due to our coverage of, of rare diseases and conditions. Um, from a safety perspective, we found that uh, our advice was 97% safe as measured by doctors, which was on par with doctors themselves. And by safety, we define that as if we told someone that they did not have to go to an emergency room or that they could be served with a telehealth consultation, was that safe advice? Did the doctors agree with us? Um, and, and, and then uh, just lastly, in terms of uh, the overall accuracy, uh, we found that obviously no one compares and equals doctors themselves. But we came the closest with a 71% accuracy rate. Um, and we have all this information published. It's on our website, it's under our research papers. We encourage people to explore it. Um, and as part of it, we also found that from a coverage perspective, we're covering um, more than two or three times as many conditions as anyone else out there. We're currently covering over 3,600 conditions, which represents over 31,000 ICD-10 codes which is by far the most comprehensive medical knowledge base in the industry. And I saw that you guys have done some work with um, Sutter Health during the start of the pandemic, I believe was when you began the engagement and you launched a virtual triage for them. And I would just love to hear more about how that happened. Um, how did you guys become partners with that? Uh, what was the feedback from the patients and the providers? And what did you learn through that experience? Sure, um, well, about four years ago, 
um, Sutter's executives approached us uh, with a need to provide 24 seven triage to their users. Um, they had experimented with several different apps and platforms out there and felt that ours was both the most clinically advanced and the best user interface. So they approached us about working with them to adapt our platform to more of an enterprise platform. They became our sort of lighthouse development partner here in the US. We started working with them in late 2018 and we launched a virtual triage product for them in April of 2019. So a little over three years ago now. And uh, they have us available wherever patients access the system. And I'll pass it over to Rayon who works very closely with them on a daily basis to talk a little bit more about what we're doing and some of the results we're seeing. Yeah, so, um, you know, like Jeff mentioned, um, we've come in at first with Sutter with this idea of providing uh, healthcare, you know, access 24 seven and, um, the numbers behind it were just incredible. And that's where we realized that outside of just access for 24 seven round the clock, um, you know, there's a lot more use cases that Ada can have. So when we looked at first, the, the stuff that we had done after hours was close to 48% of Ada assessments that were completed um, outside of normal business hours, you know, really freeing up that staffing burden of, you know, answering the phones or figuring out where to send somebody. You know, Ada is able to just smartly triage patients to the right place at the right time. Um, but outside of that, um, as we had continued working through Sutter, we had learned really that interoperability is one of the most important things in the world. Um, and, you know, we use that to transmit information to and, you know, to from Ada's assessment tool to the uh, to the Epic EMR and the providers so that they have it on hand when the patient comes to them. Um, you know, and th th that was really one of the big things uh, that came out of our engagement with Sutter is this, um, is this clinical note that can be used by all providers across the board. Um, and it's what keeps clinicians engaged. It's their, um, it, it's in a language that they understand and they can use to make um, better care decisions, so. All right, that's, Super interesting. Are you able to see almost like a funnel between patient utilizes the ADA app, what percentage of those go on to see a clinician, and then from that, which have the correct diagnosis? Is that anything that you guys track? Yeah, so that is something that we are actually in, um, you know, that, that is something that we that we collect and we, we work with. Um, that, that's how we train our AI. It's how we make it smarter. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it's been great. The, the feedback from it is great. And, um, you know, clinical engagement again is really one of the big pieces, um, in order for us to be very successful. So, and if I could just add a little bit to that, Katie, um, yeah. what we find in working with Sutter and we're also working with, um, one of the world's, in fact, the U S S largest integrated health system as well right now. Um, on directing their patients to the right care. Um, what we find is that the numbers month in, month out are pretty consistent um, in terms of the type of advice that we, we give. Um, so for instance, uh, about a year, year and a half ago, we started working with Sutter and mapping in telehealth consultations. And we found uh, during that time, we're able to drive about 13, 14% of all assessments into a telehealth consultation, which helps them increase the ROI, the investment they have on their own uh, uh, telehealth platform. Uh, we find globally that a significant uh, number of assessments result in some kind of mental health issue. We're seeing that more and more obviously since the pandemic has started. And uh, Sutter has a, a new mental health program called Scout that they're making available to uh, younger people, uh, uh, both teens and adolescents, as well as young adults. And we're now starting to drive patients into programs like that. So in addition to just driving people to the right care, we're also able to drive them into either a chronic care, manage pro uh, chronic care management program or some other uh, 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 platform that they have that can help them with whatever uh, they're particularly experiencing. Yeah, the mental health piece there's such a shortage in providers. And I think oftentimes people don't continue to pursue the care that they need because of the fact that they feel like it's going to be too long to get in with somebody. And so they may not seek help. And so that's really promising that it is able to sort of shorten that time frame and close the gap for people. And so Rayan, you talked a little bit about the notes and how that information goes back to the clinical teams and how beneficial that they find that information to be. 
Um, is the happiness of the clinical teams that you work with a uh, high priority? And yeah. did you feel I, any pushback or how are you going to go buy in? <laughs> I'd say it's probably, you know, the, the number one priority for us. Um, you know, we're, it, it's not a small ask from the clinicians, right? We're asking them to put their faith and their trust and their patients in our hands. And so, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, one of the best things that we, we always like doing is we always like telling everybody to just go ahead, download our app and try and break it. Um, or look at how, um, we approach, uh, a condition or, uh, a patient symptom. And more often than not, um, you know, clinicians come back and they're like, this is the exact approach I would have taken. These are the same differentials and things like that. So um, that, that it's so important to get clinical buy-in. Um, that's the only way we believe that we'll, we will be successful at any, any system we're at. So, um, and then the, the, the big part in getting clinical buy-in is just creating clinical efficiency. And um, that's what our, that our, you know, our handover report does. It takes all that patient reported information, puts it into a soap note format, and makes that available in the EMR for uh, for use by the provider when it comes to the encounter time. So, if if I can add to it, it's interesting because there have been some parties out there the last few years who publicly purport that AI will ultimately replace doctors. And, and we don't believe that. We believe that AI helps doctors. In fact, there's a great quote out there that um, AI itself will not replace doctors, but doctors who use AI will replace those who don't. And it's one of the things that we often encounter when we do start working with clinicians because they've heard this out there that this is a potential replacement for them. And then they quickly realize if they've only got eight to 10 minutes with a patient, we can actually help them. We can give them that full dialogue, every question, every answer. We can identify other conditions that they may not normally come across that could be caused by those same symptoms. We can recommend the tests that they need to, to uh, order or administer in order to rule out some of those differential diagnoses and things like that. So they actually very quickly learn that we're there to help them become more efficient, um, uh, more productive. And we actually have some studies going with some of our clients now where we're measuring that physician efficiency and hope to publish that over time. Yeah, when I used to work at Duke University Health System, I, when I was trying to encourage physicians to utilize more digital health tools, one of the arguments that I would make was that it would help allow them to practice at the top of their license. So essentially they would be doing the things that they specifically were trained to do and not spending as much time doing those sort of intro triage type of questions, um, you know, admin work, et cetera. And so I find that that's always a good sell for getting people interested in it because they went to medical school to be doctors, not to, you know, be administrators or <laughs> spend all of their time taking demographic information from patients. Exactly. And if I could also just elaborate a little bit more on this concept of the handover that Ryan talked about, um, we talk about making that data available to the attending clinician through the EHR or whatever it might be, but it could also be made available digitally to that next step of the patient journey. So we're finding more and more that that next step may be, for instance, a virtual chat or a telehealth consultation. And we can pass that information to that next step. So it can also take advantage of that information without having to ask the, the patient all the same questions. So in other words, in a telehealth consultation, just making that available to the attending clinician in an asynchronous or asynchronous chat, making sure that they have that available as well. And one of the interesting use cases uh, that we're, we're, we're now uh, working on is that large health system in the US that, that I mentioned, they've launched a national virtual urgent care service. And in many ways, when someone raises their hand and says, I need urgent care, obviously everyone thinks they should be at the front of the line, just like when you go to the ER. So what we do is we help assess those patients, triage them, and then actually order the queue for them so that they can make sure that those that need uh, care the most are going to the front of that line. And we're really starting to find that the, the creativity is really the only limitation to some of the use cases that we can apply ADA to. Yeah. Rand, did you want to add? Oh, yeah. I, I was just saying that was one of the biggest lessons that we had learned from Sutter, right, is that we needed a solution that was interoperable and was able to talk to every single digital health tool available because, you know, healthcare is going through a shift and everybody is using digital health now. So, you know, 
what makes ADA so valuable is that it can talk to either, you know, uh, like Jeff said, your telehealth provider, or it can talk to your chatbot provider, right? So there's continuity of care, continuity of information sharing all across the board with us. Yeah, and in the, you said ADA started as a medical or medical audience tool, then it moved to a consumer tool, and now it looks like it's sort of dual market approach. Do you have any idea what the split is on that? Well, I can put it, I, I'll put it to you this way. Um, we did start as a clinical decision support tool and it was really the rise of what I'll call Dr. Google six, seven years ago that caused us to pivot to the consumers. We just saw more and more consumers going online and Googling their symptoms, which resulted in them landing on what I would call a medical content site, really more designed for people to manage those conditions as opposed to, to, to diagnose them. Um, so here we are five, six years later after launching the app, We've got about 50 million users worldwide through all of our platforms. And I'd say about 25% of them, about 12 million are coming through our consumer platform. Okay. Interesting. And Rayan, you mentioned that with Sutter Health, you guys are able to send that data back into the medical record system. I don't know if this is a hardball question, but say that you guys somebody was using ADA and it was not connected with a healthcare system or the practice that they're utilizing. Is there another way for them to send that information in? Like, could they download it as a PDF yeah. or chat? Yeah. Or? You're, you're, you're spot on, Katie. They can go ahead and they can download it as a PDF. So it's available for them when they do, you know, if, if and when they do see their clinician. So, okay. um, yeah. And, and in certain instances, you know, I don't want to get too technical, but for in cases where we are integrated with EMR, you know, we're automatically prompting them to go ahead and create a MyChart account or a, uh, a patient portal account. So they're right there inside of the system. Yeah, that's great because in a lot of these patient portal accounts, when you set, send a message to your provider, you can add an attachment to it. So that seems like a pretty sim seamless way for them to be able to send the information they think is valuable to their doctors. So what, some of the work we've done, we've done on that, Katie, just to jump in, is we actually have both a patient or a user facing report as well as a clinically facing report. So that PDF that Rayon mentioned is, is much more in the vernacular of the user, the consumer. It presents all the information back in very um, uh, understandable, uh, easily to read format as opposed to the clinician version, which was designed by our doctors in concert with our partner's doctors as Rain mentioned before, it's much more designed like that encounter note, that soap note. So that over time, we're hoping that not only is it in a language that they understand, but it also will help them save time in the administrative uh, area they have and entering those notes and documenting their cases and things like that. Yeah, and to your point about administration, let's talk a little bit about the staffing shortages that are existing in healthcare right now. And do you think that the promise of AI combined with staffing shortages could potentially navigate a transition from fee-for-service to value-based care? And do you think that AI could make this easier and be better for patients and physicians overall? Uh, absolutely. I mean, what we are finding is that by making this data available to the clinicians, um, it is able to, to, to save them time. Uh, it's able to improve the outcomes because they're able to identify certain conditions, once again, that they may not normally be uh, in, in, encountering. Um, but what we're also finding is we're able to help them move towards value-based care um, by keeping people healthier. Uh, we have found that a little more than a third of all of our cases direct people away from same-day care. So if you combine one of the earlier stats we mentioned with about 50% of all usage being what I'll call off hours, kind of between 6 p.m. and 9 a.m. locally, you're realizing that this is potentially thousands of people that might be headed towards an emergency room visit or an urgent care center um, that find out that they don't need to. They can either wait to see a doctor the next day or within a couple of days. In many cases, they find they're able to take care of it themselves or to go to a pharmacy with some over-the-counter medications. Um, so we are finding, you know, overall, we're able to help those partners move towards value-based care by keeping people healthier, um, uh, reducing unnecessary but more expensive uh, care modalities. And another thing that we're starting to do with our partners is actually help them identify patients at risk of certain uh, conditions so that they can drive them into their managed care or value-based care programs. So for instance, if you think about when you go to see a doctor, you may go see a doctor for 
a cold or, or, or the sniffles. And as part of that consultation, the doctor identifies perhaps that you're, uh, you've been dehydrated lately, you're losing weight, you're urinating frequently. You would hope that the doctor would speak up and say, you know, you're showing some signs of, of perhaps diabetes, we'd like to check you out. So we're starting to do some very similar things. And if we see things in the assessment, completely unrelated to the current condition, but that might indicate that they're at risk of, of something else, we're making them available of that and we're working with our partners so that they can drive them into, once again, their chronic care management programs or managed care plans. Awesome. Yeah, I think everybody's had those moments where it's nine o'clock at night and either you're not feeling good or your kids are not feeling good and you're going down the Google rabbit hole trying to decide what you should do about it. And I think oftentimes the reason we do that is just because we want some sort of reassurance about whatever decision that we're going to make, whether it's we just wait until the morning and see how things are going or we're going to spend all night sitting in an emergency room and is it going to be worth it and so i think that by ada being offered being able to offer some peace of mind um, that's really worth a lot for people so i want to shift just a minute and talk a little bit about um, how you guys are doing as a business i saw that you recently just closed another funding round of the tune of about 120 million dollars so congratulations for that um, what do you think, what direction do you think this is going to help you guys go as a, as a company and what areas are you most excited about for growth? Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, the recent fundraise is primarily being used to, to fund our expansion in the United States. Um, we're looking to grow our business here by working across the healthcare ecosystem. Uh, you'll soon uh, hear more about us working not just with health systems, but also payers, many life sciences companies, other digital health companies. Um, that particular raise, one of the lead investors was Bayer, and Bayer recognizes the power of ADA as a consumer digital platform. And one of the interesting things you, we found is that about 14% of all assessments globally result in some kind of self-care. Well, self-care could be the proverbial take to aspirin and call me in the morning. So as part of uh, Bayer's investment, we're also now becoming the consumer uh, front end for their various websites. So when you go to BayerAspirin.com and several other sites in several different countries, you'll now see a version of the ADA symptom assessment platform, which allows patients to self-assess to determine if Bayer's over-the-counter products could help alleviate a particular condition. So you're gonna see more and more of that. Um, we're also starting to work with many of the other large life sciences companies. In particular, um, we have two major use cases with them. One is to help identify rare diseases. As you may know, there's about 7,500 rare diseases out there, many of which go undiagnosed, quite frankly, because clinicians just aren't aware of them or the symptoms. So we have found that, that aid is a terrific tool to help with the earlier identification of rare diseases. So we're actually working with a lot of the leading life science companies to model some of those rare diseases that are actually treatable so that we can elevate awareness both among the medical professionals and, and patients themselves. And then we're also starting much like we're doing with Bayer, we're uh, releasing versions of the ADA platform on some of these pharmaceutical websites to help determine if someone might be either at risk of or suffering from a condition that they treat. So here in the US, we often see commercials that get us to go to a website to determine if we're suffering from a certain condition or not. You know, Do I have fill in the blank, lower back pain? Do I have IBS? Do I have whatever.com? And when you go to those websites, you don't really find many tools to help you assess whether you truly have that. So we're doing more and more of that with, with, with life sciences companies as well. So overall, you're gonna see us continue to expand in working with various enterprises. Um, and then also on the consumer side, we're extending our value proposition by helping people actually identify the type of care and the specific care that they might wanna seek next. So in the consumer platform, where you're gonna see us building bridges between the consumer side and the enterprise side so that we can actually drive patients from the consumer app into our enterprise partners care modalities. So a user in Northern California that's using the app that finds that they do need care would ultimately be directed into our partners' uh, local facilities as well. Is there that's anything good. to that you would add, Ryan? I'm sorry. No, no, you, you you covered it really well. So I was just going to add that last bit about uh, driving and uh, kind of combining consumer and enterprise together there. So 
Well, one other thing I'll also add to that, Katie, um, uh, that's a big focus of ours is this concept of more of a personalized profile. The more information that we can learn about someone, it helps us better determine the probabilities that they're suffering from certain conditions. So in our work with the electronic health records, in addition to putting data into the record, we're also pulling some. So we're starting to pull out whether or not they have certain risk factors, their demographics, so we don't have to ask them again. And we're also starting to pick up data from trackers, wearables, connected health devices, genetic profiles, all that, because it all becomes collectible information that can help determine what someone's experiencing and, and, and certainly help you identify the probabilities. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, doing another project right now looking at real world, real world data and real world evidence, kind of a tongue twister there. But um, all of this information that you're gathering, I find can just really be an amazing data set to help develop more of this real world data around rare diseases, around medication, um, experiences that people have with medications, around, you know, even if you could potentially look at the triage and then how they were, what they were prescribed and how the treatment regimen went, um, sort of the sky's the limit as far as the data that you can potentially collect and utilize in order to make healthcare systems more efficient and have better experiences for patients. Exactly. So what makes you the most excited about the future of AI and healthcare? You've been doing this for a couple of years now, and you know, how do you see things changing? What's the trajectory over time? Um, well, I, I think first and foremost, um, we have the opportunity to really change people's lives. Um, we, in addition to the work we're doing here in the US, we have an entire division uh, focused on philanthropic opportunities. So we call it the Global Health Initiative and we're working with some of the world's um, largest philanthropic organizations, uh, making it available in lower and middle income countries. Uh, helping people seek the health care that they need um, in many of the other markets where there's more of a single payer system and, and, and they control the healthcare system. You're seeing us become more and more of that entire front door for, for the healthcare system. And I think in the U.S., um, our opportunity is to really help move the industry away from fee-for-service towards value-based care um, and actually help them do that, that, that profitably, profitably. So we're very excited about about working with more and more uh, enterprises here in the US towards that. Ryan, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, I mean, Je Jeff really summed it up well. I think the, the exciting part is being able to um, just get in with more and more uh, US health systems and US partners. Um, you know, our, our care systems here are a little, you know, disjointed. And so we'd love to be that bridge that um, makes the patient journey substantially easier and makes the clinician's life at the end of the day a lot easier as well, so. Awesome. Are you talking about any sort of partnerships with um, diagnostic centers, like places that would draw labs or anything? Yes, we are. Um, uh, on the consumer side, um, we are starting to work on offering diagnostics to people post-assessment. So if we do identify someone that is at risk of a certain condition, you will soon see us directing them to the appropriate diagnostic uh, tools that they can use to confirm or, or, or not whether or not they're suffering from a certain uh, condition. And on the enterprise side, we always work with our partners to drive their users into their particular care modalities. So in our work with Sutter and others, if we identify someone should be heading towards a certain kind of lab test or diagnostic, we'll drive them to that particular partner's services, whether it be their own lab facilities, whether it be a certain type of specialist or, or whatever it may require. I think that's about all that I have. Is there anything that you guys would like to add in closing today? Uh, Ryan, I'll, I'll offer that to you first. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say, um, you know, th thank you so much for the time and thank you for having us. Uh, we, really, we really appreciate it. I'm so glad that you guys well, are able to join us today. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, I, I just want to add that um, as a global company, I think Ada is uniquely positioned um, to really work, or not just in the US, but around the world, and to deliver these types of tools to people wherever they may be and wherever they may, they may be in need. Our continual focus on clinical excellence is a major differentiator between anyone, between us and anyone else out there. We believe that accurate recommendations has the potential to save not just time and money, but also lives. And obviously there's nothing more important than getting people to the right care at the right time. 
we're very excited about continuing to move ahead with that opportunity. Amen to that. Well, I'm bullish about your future and I wish you guys a lot of luck. Thank you very much, Katie. We appreciate your time today. Thanks, Thanks Katie.